Well, if you're like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of others, you've got the list of things you're seeking to change or accomplish, slow down, speed up, stop, or start doing in the new year. We call them resolutions. I was doing some reading about this annual practice and came across some familiar data about the success and failure rates of making resolutions. We know how this goes. This isn't new news, just some updated news for 2023. Here's how the trend goes for the next six months. Of those who make New Year's resolutions, 75% will still be successful in keeping it after one week. After two weeks, by the 15th of January, the number will drop to 71%. By the end of January, the number drops again to 64%. And by the time we get to the 4th of July, (laughs) just under half, 46% of people who make New Year's resolutions will be successful in keeping them. It turns out that seeking a better lifestyle is a big challenge every year. So here's the question. Why do people keep making long lists of New Year's resolutions. Well, as it turns out, there's some important psychology to it. Making resolutions offers us a blank slate. And who doesn't like a blank slate? We get a do-over. It creates an opportunity to get things right. Making New Year's resolutions increases our motivation and keeps us accountable. And it serves as a reminder of our commitments, all of which increases our chances of accomplishing them, at least for a short time. So we give it another whirl this year. I have to say, one of the more creative, if not entertaining New Year's resolutions I ran across this year was this one. My goal for 2023 is to accomplish the goals I set for 2022, which I should have accomplished in 2021 because I promised them in 2020 after planning them in 2019. (laughs) Wow, that's honest. I completely resonate with that. I could have written that one. Well, several years ago, I decided to stop all the New Year's resolution madness. Instead of creating a long list of resolutions and goals that I knew, even as I was writing them down, I'd abandon within weeks, I invested some energy in a different direction. Turns out that was a wise choice. I committed to focusing on just one word that would serve as my inspiration, my guiding star for the year ahead. And here's how that worked. In 2019, my one word, for the year was dwelling. Every day I focused on dwelling in the moment, being fully present right here and right now, wherever here and now was. I wrote dwelling on little sticky notes and put them where I'd see them often. And then every day I focused on being more fully present to the people I encountered and the things I was doing. I was dwelling. My word for the year 2020 was clarity. You might recall that 2020 was a a bit of a blur, but I wanted to bring some intentional focus each day to my life, my relationships, my work, my creativity and music and writing and life as a follower of Jesus. Being reminded to seek some clarity every day helped me navigate the year that was 2020. Last year, my word was thrive. With all of the changes and transition, focusing on ways of thriving in the midst of all that was going on was enormously helpful. So it's a bit of a daunting task to choose a word, just one word, to guide your life for an entire year. But each year that we've done this, we've had a great support community and we've done it together. And it's really proven to be an adventure. So my one word for 2022 was attention. Can I have your attention? As in, for me, paying attention to what's in front of you. The word I selected last December at a gathering was the word go. And I picked that word as a response to being socially isolated for two years in the pandemic. Part of our response to that word was my husband and I resumed attending worship here at Prince of Peace in person 
The word I chose this year is family. And the reason I chose it is during the first like year and a half of COVID, we as a family, expanded family, we're not getting together as much as we used to. In addition, the, the family word means more to me this year too because both our boys in the last year and a half have um, gotten married. And uh, in addition to a bunch of nieces and nephews that also have been married recently. So the family is expanding and I'd love to get in, uh, be more in touch with both uh, existing family members and the new ones. My word is joy. Joy comes in the morning. We jump for joy. We sing praises of joy. Uh, the Lord gives us strength and joy. Uh, I love this word because I realized that deeper than fleeting happiness, joy is a choice. And every day we, uh, regardless of circumstances, we can choose the extent to which we are filled with joy and choose to not let the ups and downs of life affect our joy. The frosting on the cake was the Prince of Peace mission trip in July to Tanzania. Let's go. It's been a super fun adventure. And the biggest thing I've learned from attention is that it is the rarest form of generosity. Giving attention is a gift of generosity and of love. That's my one word for 2022. So I've been doing some thinking about my one word for 2023. And I have to say, one of the best words to make the short list so far for me this year is seeking. As in seeking Jesus, seeking his wisdom in everything I do, seeking his way of compassion and love and patience and serving, seeking his way of life. Think about how impacting it could be to go into the next 365 days asking questions and being curious about how seeking the Jesus way each day could shape the way we interact with others, our family and friends, the barista, a server in a restaurant, another driver, people we know, people we don't know. There's some wisdom in all of that. This weekend, we're concluding our series from generation to generation. For the past six weeks, we've been learning how our lives and histories and actions and stories are interconnected, woven together. One of the guiding passages comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 48 through 50, where Mary, when she discovers that she's pregnant with Jesus, comes to this conclusion. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. We've looked at several biblical characters and how each one contributed to the next generation and participated in God's movement of liberation and love. We also saw how some characters tried to obstruct God's justice and wondered what we could learn from them. What is our role now? What is our generation's task? What do we need to leave behind and what will we carry forward? Today, as we conclude our series, we meet the Magi, wise men from the East. In the passage from Matthew 2, the wise men are seekers. They are seeking Jesus. They come to worship him. There are several fascinating things about this story, including a paranoid head of state, rumors of a government coup, a clandestine meeting of religious and civic leaders, a city held hostage by fear, an immigrant family with ties to Israel's most famous leaders, a trio of international scholars caught up in a murder plot of biblical proportions a mysteriously bright star, and the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy that will change everything. But Matthew has more in mind than telling a riveting story about an impromptu baby shower complete with what seems like impractical gifts. What's fascinating is that Matthew carefully, intentionally, describes who these wise men are, who they're seeking, in a way that compels us to ask, who are we seeking? Who is this child? Who is this king? Who is this shepherd, this ruler, this Messiah? It's all here in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east 
came to Jerusalem asking, where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. So calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, Bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, for many of us, the wise men have been part of the original story from the beginning. The historical chronology of the birth story of Jesus gets a little fuzzy around the edges. We know that. Who was there, where they came from, uh, how many were part of the entourage, uh, when they actually arrived, and how long they stayed are all good questions for another conversation. But imagine the nativity scene displayed on your neighbor's lawn uh, at a big box hardware store or even under your own Christmas tree at home. There's a good chance that three bearded dudes wearing crowns, flowing robes, and flanked by camels are part of the scene. They're most likely positioned near the entrance, just outside. They're peering into the already overcrowded stable, bringing what seems like wildly impractical gifts for a baby, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It is by now a tired and overused attempt at humor that if they had been three wise women who had brought the gifts to the baby Jesus, they would have brought diapers. Of course they would have. They would have brought blankets and they would have brought food. Yep, I get it. But Matthew had a different purpose. Matthew wanted people to know that these wise men were seeking not just another baby in a cattle feeder in a stable because there was no room for them in the inn. Matthew wanted people who heard and then read this story from generation to generation to think about gold as a symbol of kingship on earth, frankincense as a symbol of deity, and myrrh, an embalming oil as a symbol of death and who it is that would be worthy of those gifts. So, Matthew places the wise men in the story to spark curiosity about who they're seeking. And their seeking brought them to Jesus. And their story sets up the ultimate question for anyone who has ever wondered, who is this child? What child is this? The story of the Magi, the wise men ultimately challenge us to keep seeking Jesus. Who is this child? the shepherd, and this Messiah. Let me break that down for us. First, Matthew wants us to keep seeking Jesus, the child. And so, we come as children seeking Jesus, the child. There's something very powerful about looking into the face of an infant. When we look into a small child's face, there's always wonder and curiosity, connection and affection. For the past eight months, we've been getting to know Wilson Kelso, and Wilson has been getting to know us around here. Now, we certainly do love Amy and Wally, Wilson's mom and dad, but it's safe to say that we really love Wilson. I've often slowly walked up to his car seat and peered into his sweet face. 
it's been easy to feel nearly overwhelmed with the sheer wonder of this new life. Safe to say, Wilson probably wonders about all the faces that frequently appear mere inches from his own face. Over time, however, the wonder and the curiosity we've experienced in those moments have grown into a connection that has created some affection. Every metaphor breaks down at some point, but as we keep seeking Jesus together in this place, as we continue to look into the face of the Christ child, Jesus, we grow in our wonder and curiosity and connection and affection with Jesus. How would you lean into that if your word for the coming year was seeking? How, how would you grow in your wonder and curiosity about Jesus? How would you grow in your connection to and affection for Jesus? You would probably make some commitments, resolutions to getting to know him even better. You would probably commit to reading scripture with a bit more frequency and intentionality. You would probably consider coming to the Engage Bible study on the book of Revelation that begins next week. Or you'd probably want to gather with some friends to discover ways together how to seek Jesus in our lives together. You would probably be amazed by how often serving other people and being in conversation about seeking Jesus helps us to grow more deeply. These are all ways that we keep seeking the child, Jesus, and growing in our wonder and curiosity and connection and affection for him. Second, Matthew wants us to keep seeking Jesus, the shepherd. And so we come as sheep seeking the shepherd today. The Magi were seekers. They were naturally curious and wanted to know more. They were seeking wisdom, but not just any wisdom. They were seeking transcendent truth. They were seeking the divine, and their seeking brought them to Jesus, the shepherd. But there's a big twist here, a big twist. Let me explain. While the role of a shepherd is mostly unfamiliar in our 21st century context, the implications of Jesus as the shepherd of our lives are vitally important. A shepherd's role is to guide, guard, and lead the sheep. The shepherd is deeply committed to the sheep and their well-being. In Luke's version of the life of Jesus, there's a parable that Jesus uses to show how extravagant and committed the shepherd is to the sheep. Which one of you, Jesus asks a crowd, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When the shepherd has found the sheep, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Have you ever felt lost? Have you ever felt trapped, stuck, backed into a corner, honestly not knowing what your next step or move might be? The promise from Scripture is that Jesus, the Good Shepherd, seeks us out. He is the one who comes looking for us. So, sure, the wise men were seeking God, but God surprised them by showing up in the disarming form of a child, a childlike shepherd who guides and guards and protects and gathers and comforts and loves his flock. Friends, we're that flock. It may be that our seeking of Jesus brings us to that moment where we discover that we have already been found by the shepherd Jesus in our moments of feeling great loss. Third, Matthew wants us to keep seeking Jesus, the Messiah. And so we come as people seeking a savior because sometimes we need to be rescued, and delivered and set free, helped out, comforted and loved. We need to be saved. If I were to ask you today what one word would serve as your inspiration, your guiding star for the year ahead, you might choose dwelling. You might write that word on a little sticky note and put, put it where you'd see it often. And then focus on being more present to the people that you're with every day, dwelling more intentionally in what you do every day. You might choose the word clarity. 
because life often seems like a bit of a blur and you could certainly do with a little more focus, right? You might choose the word thrive because you've lost a loved one and you're unsure how you'll move ahead. You might choose the word thrive because you're coming to that stage of life or already in it where it seems like everyone around you is making decisions for you. You might choose the word thrive because you don't want to make a well-intentioned list of changes only to watch them evaporate into the mist of good intentions. Well, the Magi came seeking the Savior. We too come seeking a Savior. We come seeking Jesus, the Messiah, the one who rescues us from hopelessness the one who delivers us from evil, the one who sets us free from the powers of addiction, the one who helps us when we can't help ourselves, the one who comforts us in times of raw, grinding grief, the one who loves us when we feel utterly unlovable, the one who saves us for life and more life. These are all ways that we keep seeking the Messiah, Jesus. My one word for 2023 may very well be seeking, as in seeking Jesus, the child, the shepherd, the Messiah, the one who is seeking me, seeking us. What's your word? What one word would help you keep seeking Jesus? To help you discover what that one word might be and even how that one word might choose you, I've created a five-day devotional that you can find on our website. This five-day devotional will help lead you through the process of discovering that one word. And as you lean into that word and into this new year, may God's peace be with you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you find us that you choose us and that you are breathing the new breath of a new year into us even in these moments. We pray that as we go into the days ahead that we might find you in some surprising ways. And when we do, we will give thanks for all of the newness. It's in the strong name of Christ that we pray and all God's people said, amen.